Okay, so probably you have a laptop at your house, right? Or a desktop, maybe both, right? Or maybe you have a little computer that you carry around in your pocket. <laughs> we all have those, right? And they have really become a way of life to us. It's difficult. I mean, how many times do you are about to go out the door and it's, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? And we're always kind of looking for where that thing is. But it wasn't like that that long ago. Most of you in the room here can remember a time when there wasn't any of that kind of communication and you left and then you just left. <laughs> and then you came back when you came back and you didn't let everybody uh, know and um, you just arrived. And so, but anybody know when the first personal computers came on the market or were developed? I looked it up, 1971. I was surprised at that because I thought it was more recent than that. But 1971 was the first personal computer um, microprocessors micro, micro were in 1974. The first Apple computer was in 1976. 1977 was the first mass marketed uh, personal computer, and it was the Commodore PET, and it had a whopping four kilobytes of memory. <laughs> it's funny compared to what we have in our pockets now, but that was what they they mark as the dawn of the information age, about middle of the 1970s. And it's kind of funny looking back at that, at what was so amazing and such enough of a change to redefine generations to come. Because with the advent of the smartphone, I mean, our access to information has grown exponentially. And I actually heard uh, somebody talking about this just recently, and it said that the Dark Ages was a time when uh, people were ignorant because they didn't have access to information. And he said, it's kind of like what we're in now is the Bright Ages because we have, people are ignorant because they have too much information, <laughs> right? I mean, it's because we have so much information coming at us all the time. We're literally almost drowning in it. I mean, sometimes I just want to put my phone down and have it not tell me anything. Please stop giving me updates. Please stop telling me things. I, and I, you know, so we've gotten so much information coming at us now that we don't even know what's real anymore. It's so all the, but all the messages that we receive are not bad messages, right? I mean, we need uh, information about how to do our jobs or how to make a healthy meal or interact with our families or in-laws. And Paul even said a very long time ago that how do we even know the message of the gospel if somebody's not bringing it to us by preaching or teaching or exhorting us? So we do need information. We all need information, but the truth is that we have to learn how to discern which messages to listen to and which messages to dismiss and how to prioritize one message over the other. And you've probably heard it rightly said that the things that are urgent are always not always important, and the things that are important are not always urgent. So we need to be careful about how we uh, interact with information and learn to what focus what we need to focus on correctly. And the book of Hebrews exhorts us to do just that and to tune our ears to the most important message that we can ever have in all of life. And if we remember back at the beginning of our study, the first three verses of Hebrews tell us that God has spoken. Now we have a message from God and it came from him and the message that he gave us is Christ. Not necessarily, at, yes, what Christ said, but also in the sending or the coming of Christ, that's a declaration by God. And so we learned in verse the verses 3 and 4 here that uh, Christ came and what he did was to reveal the Father to us and showed us his great love in, in rescuing us from sin. So there's no greater message than that and, and that always needs to rise to the top. And so I made this really basic outline for you because when I decided I wanted to, uh, thought I, God was leading me to teach Hebrews, I had no idea how complicated it was. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is hard. So I tried to really make this as simple as possible as I could. And uh, you have one, and if you don't have one, grab it on the way out tonight. But uh, it's, it, it's, it's really basic. And the whole thing is that Jesus 
Christ is superior, that he is greater than, and you'll see right here, we're in the purple block here, that Jesus is superior to angels. And last time we spent the whole time uh, learning about that and seeing how the Old Testament and the old, all the references that the writer gave us to prove and proclaim the superiority of Christ to the angels and all other created beings. And if you remember from that, that uh, what he's, he taught, what, what we learned there is that they believed that the law came through God, through two angels, and then to Moses. And so they elevated uh, a revering angels because they elevated the law as the greatest thing. And so there was nothing in the Jewish mindset that was greater than the law. And so if they were part of bringing the law, that they made them great too. And so the author here says in the first chapter that yes, angels are great. They are mighty. They are splendid beings, but they aren't even close to the greatness of Jesus. And so his purpose was not just to give us all this information about angels, but he brings chapter one to a point at the beginning of chapter two. And this passage here is the first of five warnings that you will see in this book. And you see it in this uh, outline here at the bottom here that there are five warnings there. And so it's like he gives us information and he says, now here's what you need to do with it. And that's exactly what he says starting in chapter 2, verse 1. He starts with this word, therefore. Now I want you to train yourself as you are reading through the book of Hebrews during our study to look for this word. It appears 21 times in this book alone. Now, what it does, what the word therefore does, is that it serves to connect a truth to a proper response. Now, so in effect, it's saying, this is so, therefore, do this. So that's what he's, what he's telling us. So, he's, so when you're reading at home, circle this word, underline this word, highlight this word, and then look what it says Next, what kind of action, based on the information he gave you before, what kind of action is he calling you to do? So, we get started here. Therefore, he says, based on everything that we've heard all the way in chapter 1, therefore, he tells us we must, and that word must there is an emphatic uh, word. It tells us that, you know, this is important, and it's in the present tense, so it's telling us to keep going, that we need to do this, and it needs to lead us to action that is ongoing. So he's saying that we must pay clo pay closer attention. Now, we do not need uh, to do a big word study on what it means to pay attention, right? So if, if somebody tells you, or you're trying to tell somebody else, you say, I want you to pay attention, or if you're telling your kids, pay attention to this, you're not asking them to hear words, are you? You're asking them to listen to what I'm saying and then follow through with action. So if you tell your kid, pay attention to me, when I get home, I want that room clean. That doesn't mean, Mom, I heard some words. Yes, I heard you. That means follow through with actions. And that's exactly what he is saying here. And, um, and so... Now, the, so he's saying, pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, the importance of a message is largely uh, determined by the sender who's, or the person who's speaking, right? So we give what, much more weight if it's an important person. So how many of you people who are, work at a company, if you got a letter from the boss or the CEO, if it said, Pay attention to this was in the two, I mean, is in, in the subject line, assuming it's not fishing, assuming that is really real. What, how many of you would just wait till you just got around to it two, three days from now? I'll read it when I get want to. No, we would see that, see the name of the person who's sending it and go, okay, I need to read this right now. I need to stop what else I'm doing and read it. Or let's say that you got a letter in the mail with a presidential seal on it. And this was a handwritten letter. This is not, you know, the junk that's in your mailboxes right now, uh, you know, political ads and stuff. But this is a genuine personal letter. Now, I don't care what your politics are. You would think that that was weighty important, right? You would open it and go, oh, my goodness, I've got a personal handwritten letter from, you know, the head of the United States. Wow, that's amazing. Because it would feel weighty right and so but now listen 
what we got here in Hebrews is, in this letter, we have heard a message from what we saw in verse 1, from God. And he has spoken, and what we have heard is about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the heir of all things. He's the creator of the universe, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, the sustainer of all things, the purifier of sin, the ruling at the right hand of the Father, and superior to the angels. Now that's a list, right? And if, it, if just any one of these was true, it would be enough for us to pay attention to what he was saying. But all of them are true. And so paying attention to this message is of supreme importance. So we have to ch make a choice in our daily comings and goings to, allow, to filter out things that are less important and major on the message from Christ, which is superior. So we have this precious and this clear message from God, and we hold it in our hands, and we carry it around with us. And, you know, a lot of times what we do when people are trying to explain it to us is we yawn. We're like, oh, yeah. You know, and we're distracted, and we think about other things, and we pick up our phones, and we look at the, the you know, things on there that are way less important instead of listening to the pastor preach and expound on his word or tuning into the smil still small voice of God or focusing on prayer. <laughs> you know, see, God's not going to send you a text message. He is not going to get a bullhorn and shout at you or send an angel to jump up and down in front of you. He calls us gently. He gives us his word in front of us, and we have to choose to direct our minds and our hearts and our spirit to that beautiful word. Now why? What does he say? We must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Now this is nautical imagery here, ships and oceans, that's what he's talking here. And, it's, and so this imagery is only used here in the New Testament, and it refers specifically to of the mooring of a vessel to an anchor point. So if it's tied securely, then the ship stays in place. Uh, but if it's not moored correctly, then the winds and the waves will cause it to shift and drift around. Now, my mom and dad had a small house at High Rock Lake in North Carolina from the time I was five years old, and we hardly ever went on vacation, but we went every single weekend every, from, from uh, Memorial Day to the Labor Day. We went there every weekend, and we played at the lake, and she had, they had a ski boat, and we had wonderful fun. And so they had a, a cab, lake cabin, and they had a stationary pier, and then they had had a floating pier. And so we would spend all day out on the lake skiing and having a good time. And then we would come in, dock the boat. And I remember this one time, uh, probably happened more than once, but once I remember for sure, is that we had docked the boat and we scrambled up the hill. It was up on, the cabin was up on the hill. So we'd go up the hill and uh, went up there to, to start eating, uh, our, you know, start the cookout like we always did. And we were sitting up there and, um, and one, somebody, one of the people looked down and the boat had not been tied to the pier and it began to drift and he had gotten the waves from the passing boats, had made it rock out of the, the floating pier and it was down the lake past the, um, past the neighbor's house and everybody went, oh my gosh. And so they went scrambling down, we all went scrambling down the hill, jumped in the lake, swam out to get it and brought it back. Now, nobody came and got in the boat and drove it, drove it down the lake. Nobody did that. The boat just floated away because it wasn't secured. So that illustration reminds us that drifting doesn't mean you necessarily go off into some gross sin or turn your back and abruptly walk away from your faith. Now, somebody, sometimes people do that, but a lot, you know what most people do that leads them far away from God? Absolutely nothing. They don't do anything at all. And that's the point. Drifting away from God requires you to do absolutely nothing. Drifting doesn't require any effort at all. 
The current and the waves of the world will just carry you away without you even knowing it if you're not paying attention. And drifting here in the Hebrews is pictured as so slow and so subtle that eventually our commitment to Christ just floats away and it becomes unimportant and it just doesn't matter that much anymore. I mean, we excuse ourselves, right? I mean, I'll read the Bible, I'll pray, I'll come to church, I'll find temptation later. Because right now, I'm tired, or it's too much work, or I'm just going to watch this show tonight, or I'll read the scriptures later, and we stop paying attention to what's most important. Now remember, he's not writing to unbelievers here. He's not writing to Christians here for the most part. And what is true then is true now. None of us are exempt from the dangers of drifting. I mean, just because you come to church does not stop you from drifting. You can show up for church every single Sunday and still begin to trip, uh, drift when you stop policing what you think about. When you, begin, when, you stop, uh, when you start allowing justifications in your life for things you know that are outside the will of God. Or when you let the filter for our screens or what we put in our ears just turn down a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. Because what does it matter if I watch one more video or spend a little more time on social media? I mean, what's the big deal? And right there is the starting point for drifting. Because it actually takes commitment and faithfulness and dedication to continue spiritual growth and maturity. Francis Chan says it like this, we never grow closer to God when we just live life. It takes deliberate pursuit and attentiveness. And he's right. He's absolutely right. If you just live your life, you don't grow closer to God. Because yielding is hard. Surrender is difficult. Letting go of my rights and my preferences takes work. And it takes commitment to the truths of the Bible as the superior message to all other messages that we hear every day. But resolute commitment and radical obedience are the oars that we use to stay on course. And I, I think this is the real issue for people who have been in church a long time. I mean, genuine Christians, we get a little bit older and the kids are grown and they're gone or we're tired and we start giving ourselves a pass. We start saying, yeah, well, uh, I did all that work then, and but now I'm just going to take a break and I want to do what I want to do. And what happens? You begin to drift. If you've read any of the Old, Te uh, the Old Testament, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you'll see that even the good kings of Israel, uh, when they would they would go hard after God when they were young, but they sometimes you get to the end of those stories and they wound up in crazy places in their life is like, like straight up idolatry, and you're going, how did that happen? How did that happen? This guy who just you know mowed down everything that was was anti God, and then suddenly. He's, he's worshiping uh, an idol himself. That's because when they got older, they started to let their commitment slide. And those guys are a warning to us. And exactly what the writer in Hebrews here is exhorting us to pay attention to. So, move on here in verse 2. He, said, he goes back to the point of angels. and He says, for since the message declared by angels proves to be reliable. Now, remember what we talked about last time. The message he's talking about here is the law of God. Uh, and so uh, he calls it here a message declared by angels, uh, but it is the Old Testament law of Moses. And so he says, since it pro proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Now let me explain to you what's going on here. So uh, he's describing the way the law worked. And so there were lots of rules about what to do, what not to do, and what happens if you don't do it, or what happens if you do do it. And this is why people have trouble with Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Because there's a lot of these laws that have these consequences. It's spelled out what you have to do and what you have to not do. But the point here he's making is that all the way back from, from all the way back to the time of Moses, they knew, the Hebrews knew and understood that if you broke the law of God, there was a consequence. 
That's what he's saying here. Now, some things were milder penalties, like if you broke something, you might have to go take a sacrifice, or you might have to do a ceremonial washing or something like that. But there's some that had swift and immediate consequences. Like, you remember the story of Uzzah, who was uh, trying to steady the ark of God when David was trying to bring it back to Jerusalem, uh, to Jerusalem? And he reached out to steady it, and he touched that ark, and bam, he died right then. There was no discussion. There was no, uh, wait a minute, um, I didn't mean that. There was no reasoning, no second chances. Violation of the law of God sometimes resulted in death. Now, sometimes God handed it out, the penalty right there like that, or sometimes he instructed people to, to carry out a death sentence, like in the uh, event of stonings for some things that were done. So this verse here is just saying that there was a penalty for breaking the law. Verse 3 then asks a question uh, that says, how shall we escape if we neglect such great salvation? Now I'm going to come back to this in a minute, so hold that for a second. I want to look at verse 4 and then come back to this question at the end. So what verse 4 does, it, it he's saying this is a great salvation. So then he gives like supporting evidence in verse 4 for why our salvation is so great. And he says, so first he says, our, great, our salvation is great because it was declared by the Lord. So don't just slide over this part here. This is a huge piece because what he's saying here is that salvation is God's idea. The plan to redeem you, to make you whole, to give you life, hope, joy, peace came from God. He, he came up with this. No human being came up with this idea. Now that's not the picture that we get from the world about who God is, right? I mean, mostly people think he's trying to take something away from you, take away your freedoms, or he's just trying to be mean. That <laughs> He's just waiting for you to step out of line to beat you over the head. That is not the God of the Bible, okay? Here's what Scripture says. Scripture says Jesus knows all your sin. He knows the ones you've never spoken about to anyone out loud. The things that are hidden in the secret recesses of your heart, he knows about them, but instead of judgment and condemnation that we all deserve, by the way, he came to you and says, I offer you life. I offer to take all of that stuff away from you and give you myself in return. Does that sound like a mean God? I mean, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me, right? He's giving you the best he has to give you in offering release to you from eternal death and, uh, and give you eternal life. Now, there is a lot of evil in this world. I understand that. A lot of unexplainable things that I do not understand at all. And, uh, but God is not the author of those things. He is not the author of evil. So I don't know what you've experienced in your life from uh, at the hands of someone who was twisted by sin and selfishness, but that's not God. He is not mean. He is the only one who can rescue us out of that stuff, bring us freedom, give us total restoration, and he offers it to you for free. So don't let the familiar familiarity of that message dull you to its marvelousness. It was declared by God himself. And then it says, it was attested us by attested to us by eyewitnesses. So this is referring specifically to the uh, to uh, the resurrection. Now, if you read the book of Acts, it tells us that when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples, and then to 500 witnesses. Now, see, salvation is only great if it's true, right? If it's not true, it's not great. <laughs> and so the writer here tells us that, it, that there were eyewitnesses, and a lot of them, it's very difficult to get a story straight with 500 people, right? Try to tell five people, and it blows up on you, right? But 500 people said, yes, I saw the risen Christ. And the writer here is not a first-generation eyewitness, okay? That's what he says. It's attested to us by those who heard. So he didn't see Jesus resurrected himself, but saw, but was told by people who did. So now, just a 
quick comment on the book of, of Hebrews. This is bonus material, so uh, this is just an aside, but I thought it was a really good place to share it because most people don't know why the New Testament is the 26, 27 books that we have. It's like, why is it that, those? Why, you know, why is it some others? How did you just decide that? And so um, there's a, there, there are a lot of conferences back in the 200s and 300s, and that's all very complicated. And, and so I'm not going to go into all of that, but I'll just give you the short answer of why the New Testament is the New Testament. And that is all the, uh, the New Testament books are either written by eyewitnesses, that is like John, Matthew, Peter, who were disciples, and Paul has included that because he saw the resurrected Christ on the Damascus Road. So they were all eye, those guys were eyewitnesses, or they were authors who who interviewed eyewitnesses. Like we studied the Book of Mark last time. We remember he he um, he he interviewed Peter. And if you read the first part of Luke, there he says, "I interviewed a lot of people." So he interviewed a lot of eyewitnesses to get his account, and that would have covered Acts as well. And so, so what about Hebrews? So what about Hebrews? Because we don't know who wrote that. So how do we know that that should be included in, in the New Testament? This is this verse right here. And that he said, it was attested to us that his, he includes himself in that by those who heard. That is, whoever he was, that he got the message from somebody who got it declared by the Lord himself. So he got the gospel message from somebody who was an eyewitness. That's why Hebrews is in, included in the New Testament canon. So, so then we have our salvation is great because it was confirmed by the Holy Spirit manifestations, and that takes us past the resurrection and the ascension into the book of Acts with the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the gifts all had the same purpose, and that was the validation of the gospel message then the, the, the disciples were commissioned to go out and take that message to the world, and they established the church, and here we are. So verse 3 and 4 remind us of the divine nature of the message of the gospel. So to wrap this lesson up, I want to go back to uh, verses 2 and 3. So remember, um, the message was declared by angels, and then there was a... a, a a, um, consequences for breaking the law of God. And then we have this big heavy hitting question here. So what he does in these verses right here is to use a Hebrew way of arguing a point called qual wamer. Now you don't have to write that down, but what it literally means is light and heavy, but it's a way that Hebrews argued a point and it employed a way of reasoning that said if something is true in a light or lesser thing, then it's even more true in a heavier or greater thing. And Jesus used this way, uh, just this way of arguing, you know, this verse, if you then, though you are evil, know how to good, give, give, give good gifts to your children, that's the lighter thing. So you're evil, you know how to treat your children well. He says, if that's true, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So it's... The lighter thing is the, the earthly fathers know how to um, treat their children well. So the heavier thing is that the heavenly father also will give good gifts to his children. So, and that's what we see here in Hebrews. That is, he's saying, if the message by angels has a consequence for disobedience, that's the lighter or lesser thing, then it's also true in the heavier or greater thing that a message from God in the great salvation, the great salvation that he has given us, is, is also going to be a, a heavier penalty. So, so this is the heavier or greater truth. That is, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? There's nothing heavier or more important than that message, the great salvation that God has given us. So, there's a transgression for breaking the law of Moses. There is a greater penalty for ignoring the great salvation that Jesus himself delivered. So remember back to the illustration of getting a letter from a president and how we, that would get your attention? Well, imagine if his motorcade showed up in your driveway. 
And Secret Service came out, knocked on your door, and said, hey, the president's here, wants to talk to you. I'm pretty sure that would get your attention, too, even more. I was like, oh, my goodness, what is happening here? And you would be pretty respectful and listen to what he had to say. I don't care if you like him or not. I mean, it's the president, right? There's some respect there that, that you um, need to give. So he is saying here, you know, we've gotten a greater message than from a president or any head of state. And that message is from the king of kings. And he stamped it in his blood. And this message is powerful and we need to listen to it. So in this message that he sent through his, through his son is more binding than what the angels delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. And then he asked this real heavy question. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And the obvious answer to this rhetorical question is, you can't. You can't. There is no escape from neglecting the great salvation. We tied this back to the nautical imagery we had just a minute ago. It's just basically saying there's no other out lifeboat out there for you. This is the only one. And this is a strong warning to his readers, both Christian and non-Christian, against being careless and neglectful and unconcerned about the truths that are contained in the gospel. So for the unbeliever, he's obviously talking about neglecting the call to salvation. And that word neglect there reminds that you, us that you don't have to resist, you don't have to overly reject, you don't have to despise, you don't have to oppose the gospel with hostility to end up being separated from God for all eternity. It doesn't have to be that obvious. You can be a really nice person and keep your lawn up and help your neighbors and give money to the Red Cross and still not go to heaven. I have a family member who, who has a problem with this and resists the gospel for this specific uh, reason. Now, she doesn't understand this concept, and the question is, she asks, and you probably heard it too, how can God send good people to hell? And I've talked about this before, of course, but the Bible is clear that there is no one who is good. There's no one who is good. Because without Jesus, even nice people wind up separated from God. Because God didn't send Jesus to make bad people good or to make good people better. He came to make dead people alive. Ephesians chapter 2 said we are dead in transgressions and sins. Not pretty good people who mess up sometimes. Not nice people who need to try harder. We are dead. And you cannot revive yourself. Only God can do that. So here's, this thing, here's the thing. This idea that God sends people to hell is absolutely false. God does not send people to hell. We are born with hell as our destination, and we need to be rescued from that. But if you don't do anything, i.e. neglect a great salvation, then you wind up arriving at the place that you were going to, to begin with. Okay? And it was your own choice to neglect the lifeboat. Especially here in this country where the gospel is on every corner, in every place, on your phone, on the television. That's neglecting just to ignore it. That's the reality. God has never sent a single person to hell. Now everyone who will spend eternity there chose it by neglecting the offer to change their destination from the love of a gracious, kind-hearted God. And a whole lot of those who choose that separation from God did it not out of anger or hostility or anything like that. They just chose to do nothing. Just going to live my life. And that is the disaster of indecision. When you have the gospel right in front of you. And if you're not sure that you are saved, please do not leave this, this building tonight without talking to your group leader and make sure okay, that you are not neglecting so great the salvation. Now, for believers, our destination is forever changed. Hallelujah. But we can also suffer the consequences of rejecting so 
or neglecting so great a salvation too. And we lose so much from ignoring truth and being distracted by all kinds of things out there. And for us, we need to go back to first one. And that is, we need to pay much closer attention so we do not drift away. That means we walk day by day with him. We apply what we hear from preachers, not just listen, but we actually apply. That, that favorite verse that we have stuck up there on the mirror, that, are we actually doing that verse? Or we just like the way it sounds? Because we need to actually put it into our lives because it's so easy to get stuck when you get hurt or when, when you're confused. But let me tell you, God is not afraid of your struggles. And what I've learned in my life is that often it is in the struggles and sometimes for a very long time when the story does not end up with a pretty bow on it that we discovered God to be more real than we ever have before. Now Hebrews 11 is going to focus a lot on that. We're going to spend two nights on that. But it's in our determined commitment to the truth of who Christ is and what he did for us that we find the strength within us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we did not know we had. And we discover that grace is wider and deeper and fuller and broader than we could have ever imagined. And then we become fully convinced that He, Jesus Christ, is greater than everything. Even greater than our pain, in our misunderstandings, in our confusion, he proves himself that he is also enough. Amen? God, we just thank you that you are enough. That there's not any question, any concern that we can't bring to you. God, let us pour out our hearts to you. The real heart not all dressed up and pretty with a bunch of church language, but how we really feel. Knowing that you never leave us, never forsake us, and give us more than we can ever ask or imagine. God, help us not be distracted. The time is short. The days are evil, you tell us. Help us be strong stalwart in our faith so that we can be beacons of light to people who are drifting far away from you. For it's in your powerful Son's name we pray. Amen. All right.